today um, to learn about carbon taxes. This is a really complex topic, but a really important tool to help us transition to a zero carbon economy. So I'm really excited to learn more from Robert Stoddard, who is the Managing Director of Berkeley Research Group's Climate and Energy Practice. Uh, my name is Abby Bradford. I am Maine Conservation Voters Outreach Manager. My job is to help Mainers from across the state make our voices heard in the political process so that we can protect our common home and our future. Maine Conservation Voters mission is to cultivate and use political power to protect and conserve Maine's environment. MCV helps elect pro-environmental -envi candidates to office helps pass legislation to protect our environment and take action on climate change, and then holds our legislators accountable without regard to political party. A few technical notes for today's event. You are all muted, but we do want to hear from you. Please send any questions you have as they occur to you to me, Abby, through the chat. You can find that by hovering your mouse over in the bottom of your screen. If you're having any technical difficulties, you can also message Will Sedlak through that same chat. There's Will. Uh, we are recording today's event and we will post that video to our website later this afternoon. The agenda for today is we'll first be hearing from Robert about carbon taxes. Then I'll do a quick call to action to let you all know how you can get involved um, in Maine's Climate Council process, which is drafting a climate action plan for Maine this year. Then we will do a Q&A with Robert. Um, I'll compile your questions as you send them um, and select uh, common questions for him to answer during that time. And at the end, we'll wrap up and let you know what next week's Lunch and Learn is. Um, thank you all again for joining us and I will hand it over to Robert. Robert, once you get your slides up, you are muted. But... Well, hello, everyone. And it's a great pleasure to be here and to join Maine Conservation Voters. Uh, I've done a lot of work with Betha Hearn and MCV over the years on various renewable and environmental bills in the legislature. It's been great fun working with her and highly effective. So today we are going to look at carbon taxes and with a goal of not trying to drill all the way down. It's a very complicated topic. There are prof professionals who spend their full time working on this, but um, to try to give you some perspectives. So as we see various carbon taxes proposed and discussed, you have an idea of what to look for and what to think about as we go forward. So The overall agenda for the day, <clears throat> I'm going to start, I'm an economist and I, I like to think about things from the basics of why are we doing it? What's the economic foundation of a policy? That leads directly into the right way of designing a carbon tax. And there are many choices here, whether we're using a, a straight tax, whether you're using tradable permits, how much is taxed, how you avoid leakage problems on the edges of the uh, space you're taxing. The third piece we'll look at is the use of proceeds. Um, carbon taxes generate a lot of money and how that money is used has tremendous implications for the economy and equity of the transition. And finally, a, a few ideas for actions that you as voters can take to encourage responsible carbon tax implementation. The usual disclaimer, I'm speaking for myself and not for either for MCV or for Berkeley Research Group or any of the other experts at Berkeley Research Group. So let's start with the economic foundations of carbon pricing. So this is a general comment that when we see market failures, 
as economists. We think that that is a place where government has a role for action. Uh, a market failure is when we have an allocation of goods and services that is not efficient. It's not the best use of those resources. Uh, we see these often occur in the case of monopolies or when there is what's called an externality, when my use or action creates either positive things that I don't capture or negative things that I'm not afflicted by. Pollution is a classic case of a public nuisance. Then there's a range of government actions we can use to offset that market failure. Sometimes the government just provides that service itself, for instance, our courts and our roads and schools. Sometimes we do it by creating competition where there was inadequate competition before, such as breaking up monopolies. Uh, we still use a lot of wage and price controls. For instance, electric, electric utility tariffs set a price that the monopolists can charge. Uh, governments, I think, most commonly think about regulations and prohibitions. For instance, health and safety regulations. Cars have to have seat belts, and the seat belts have to meet certain standards. We don't use prices to try to regulate something like that. But taxes and subsidies are a further form that the government has to tilt the field in different directions. And of course, these are common in the economy as well. We have gas taxes, we have energy efficiency rebates. So these are the policy toolkit that we can look at in solving a market problem. Of course, each of these it runs a risk of adding itself an inefficiency called a government failure. So good policy is always trying to think about finding, defining the market failure, finding a, the best solution, and minimizing the risk of government failure. So when we think about problems like pollution, the question is, should we be using a market force? Should we be you know, looking at taxes and subsidies? Or should we just be thinking about straight regulation? And of course, there are policy goals that can be achieved either way. So we have to decide which one might be better in a particular line. Regulatory structures, we typically think of as places where we can draw clear lines. There are specific actions that we want to require or prohibit. And, and this tends to be best when there's a stable, well understood pro problem. You know, with cars, as an example, um, and seatbelts. We have good evidence that seat belts save lives. Putting a seat belt in a car is an easy, tangible action. Clear lines can be drawn. Policy folks think of that market remedies tend to be better when what you want to do is to change the prices, to change outcomes. We use taxes and subsidies. And this shifts the relative prices of things to reflect the externality that wasn't captured before. And this is best in a situation where we have dynamic, uncertain outcomes. We know what we want to have happen, but we don't know the best means to get there. We wanna let businesses and homeowners figure things out that's best for them and that lead us to the desired outcome. Now, there are examples where we use both strategies simultaneously. The renewable portfolio standard for electric generation is an example. We tell retailers, 30% you know, of the energy you deliver has to be clean energy. And exactly where they buy that, how they buy that, what the prices are resulting from that is entirely left then to market operations. So as we approach then greenhouse gases, and the climate crisis they are creating. This is a classic market failure and therefore a place where government action is clearly called for. Uh, GHG emissions are like all pollutions. They're what we call a tragedy of the commons. They create a negative externality. It's really handy for someone to drive a car, but they don't see the cost of the carbon emissions from the tailpipe. Uh, the emitter gets all the benefits but very little of the harm. And that's the definition of a negative externality. So this isn't the first time we've tried to regulate pollution. And we've used both markets and regulation in the past to achieve the goals. So for instance, with regulation, we have water discharge standards. You can't have 
more than a certain amount of untreated effluent in sewage disposal. In power plants, we have something called best available control technology that's required on all new power plants. It just says, you're going to do that. Um, you know, it's not a, trying to achieve a limit. It's just saying you have to use the best thing available. Elsewhere, we've used markets. Um, you may remember there was the smog and the acid rain problems in the, uh, about 30 years ago caused by nitrous oxides and, and uh, SO2. Uh, we regulated that through a, a, a tax structure and it was very effective in managing the smog and acid rain and is still in place today and has driven down the emissions in the power sector tremendously from those uh, sources. With respect to carbon though, <clears throat> all the thinking that I've seen from economists is that we really should be using a carbon price instead of regulation. The challenge here is that the, the number of places where GHG emissions occur is so pervasive in the economy that you'd have to write regulations limiting each and every possible thing you can think of. And that's impossible to enforce, it's impossible to write. And as new technologies come along, you suddenly have to write a new regulation about it. So a carbon tax is a simple and comprehensive way of making carbon emissions more expensive and therefore driving people to look for lower cost and therefore lower emission ways of doing what they want to do or to forego doing things that are too costly. So this is widely viewed as being the most cost efficient way of getting carbon out of the economy because the lowest value emissions are the first ones to go. And to the extent we have a carbon budget we can use, we're making sure that, that carbon, those carbon emissions are occurring in the places that add the absolute most value to the economy. So that takes us then to the core questions about how you design a carbon tax or carbon pricing system to be efficient. There are really four core questions we have to come up with in designing a carbon pricing scheme. First is, what's being taxed? What, what gets charged? And the general consensus here is we're going to use what's called a metric ton of CO2 equivalent. And the advantage of using this metric is it bundles all of the greenhouse gases into a single common metric based on the global warming potential that was agreed at the Kyoto Protocol. So this picks up not only carbon dioxide, but also methane, nitrous oxides, all the fluorocarbon worlds that, and, and several other industrial chemicals that have very serious greenhouse gas effects. But there's always a question, so now you would define what we're taxing, but, or the metric for taxing, but are there gonna be exemptions? Are there certain parts of emissions that we just aren't going to count? Uh, agricultural emissions are really hard to manage. So do we just set that aside and not, not tax them? Possibly, but that has implications. The second question is really about the form of the pricing. And here we have the choice of taxes and tradable permits. And this is complicated enough, we'll come back to it in just a moment. We also have to think about when do you put the price in? You could do it right at the point of production, at the wellhead or the mine mouth. You might do it at the first sale or the final sale, uh, which is traditionally places where taxes would be put. They have different implications. Final sale means that uh, you get the benefit that petroleum products use, say, as an industrial feedstock, and therefore not emitting greenhouse gases, aren't taxed. On the other hand, if you don't, if you put it to final sale, then methane leakages on gas pipelines aren't taxed either. And that's probably not a good way to go. So this is an important issue that we'll leave just to flag it as something to think about and look at in any carbon tax you're, you're considering. The fourth and a really critical issue is managing what we call leakage. And this comes from exports where we make something here, it has paid its carbon tax, and now we're sending it to 
Canada, and it's still bearing its carbon cost. We also have imports, and we have the opportunity for intra-sector substitution. And we'll talk about that and two and four in the next two slides. So these are two fundamentally different approaches to managing a carbon tax. They have their, each have their advantages and disadvantages. We can either, either use a carbon tax, which as you might suggest, is a fixed and known price per unit of emission per ton of CO2 equivalent. And that price is set by statute or regulation. Most of the proposals have that rising over time, starting at a modest level and then becoming steeper so that people have time to adjust their capital and, and how they do things, knowing that the costs are going to be high in the future. Um, just how high and how, how fast those should rise are really key <coughs> and scientific questions. Uh, Obviously, the higher and faster it goes, the greater the CO2 reduction, but also the higher the cost and disruption of the tax. Adjustments, so that if we see we are not hitting our emissions goals well, uh, I'm sorry. So some of the new, newer designs have a potential adjustment for under and over achievement. So if we find that we thought that a carbon tax is going to be sufficient, but the CO2 emissions are still going up too fast, we can increase the price or reverse. Now under a tradable carbon permit regime, instead of having a fixed price, we know we have a fixed quantity. And every time you emit a unit of carbon, you have to retire a carbon permit. This is probably similar, familiar to many of you in, in terms of a renewable energy credit. You know, each credit is created when electricity is produced from a renewable energy source. And when you count that for the purposes of meeting the renewable portfolio standard, that credit is retired. This is exactly the same structure for carbon. The quantity of available permits now is set by statute. That would decline over time. You'd, for, you'd start by making them a little smaller than current emissions, and then you track the economy downward um, at a level that again is a political and scientific debate. Um, and again, you could adjust the quantities available uh, so that the prices stay within some rails, don't go either too high or too low. The tradable carbon permit structure is exactly how the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is a compact amongst the New England states and some of the Northeastern states, uh, mid-Atlantic, um, currently impose on power plants. It's been very effective at reducing the carbon intensity of our electric grid. Now those permits have a price implicit because there are fewer permits being issued than historically we have used. So, that creates a supply and demand balance. Um, in the case of Reggie, there is a periodic auction that issues those permits, collecting the money. That money is paid back to the states and the states use it as they choose. Here in Maine, a lot of that Reggie money goes into the Maine Efficiency Trust. Um, it's possible that you allocate some of those permits rather than auctioning them so that industries that require carbon emissions are not adversely affected as much, but still have an incentive to reduce their carbon. And then the permits will also trade on an open market and in private transactions. Now, a carbon tax has some advantages where it has a real clarity. You know what the price path is going to be. So as you make some plans, if you're a business owner, you're thinking about buying some equipment, you can make a decision about the value of energy efficiency or the value of a non-carbon based process. It also provides clarity to researchers and, and uh, entrepreneurs about coming up with new clever ways of reducing carbon. You can see what the value of that will be. On the other hand, it's difficult to reward negative emissions. Some of the things we can do on the climate front are to take 
carbon out of the atmosphere, for instance, through improved forestry management. And that is challenging to come up with a structure as in a, in, to reward under a carbon tax. So the tradable carbon permits also have pros and cons. Uh, it provides real clarity about what emissions track is going to be. You know, we, we say this is the amount of emissions we're going to allow. Um, and if any of these technologies that can capture and sequester carbon are available, they can receive the, they create those permits and can sell them, providing a clear value for that work. However, there's, there's a lot of price uncertainty. We can't see 10 years down the line what the carbon price will be under this system. So it's more challenging to make investments in new and expensive technologies to reduce your carbon footprint. You remember on the questions we had to look at, the fourth one was leakage. And this is challenging. Remember from the first part, carbon pricing changes the relative prices of goods and services. Goods that have a lot of carbon embedded in making them are more expensive relative to ones that have lower carbon emission. Um, if there are untaxed sectors, so for instance, we only tax right now electric generation carbon emissions. We don't tax transportation fuels emissions. That changes the relative price of electricity to gasoline and changes your decision about whether you should buy an electric vehicle or a gasoline vehicle. And unfortunately, it changes it in the direction of choosing to buy a gas vehicle instead of an electric one. So leaving some sectors untapped, untaxed, can miss some low-hanging fruit about how it can lower GHGs very cost-effectively. More problematic is the idea of untaxed economies. You know, Maine can't tax New Hampshire, nor can Maine put a tariff on goods imported from New Hampshire. So, uh, but if we put a carbon tax on as Maine alone, it will increase the cost of locally produced goods, not only internally, but from those, uh, for those that are exported. Uh, so that, that can hurt local production for local use and for export. It could also even have a perverse effect that it could increase our carbon emissions. If instead of producing uh, manufactured goods here in Maine with a very high proportion of renewable power, we buy those from China with a high proportion of coal and um, are substituting a low emission product for a high emission product. Now, when we step away from a, thinking about a Maine carbon tax to a US carbon tax, you know, the United States, as any sovereign nation, can impose a import or export tariff or adjustment. And so commonly we're looking at something called a carbon border tariff, which ensures that if we import product from a country that doesn't have a carbon tax, the cost of the embedded carbon is reflected in the price of the product. And likewise, if we export to a country that doesn't have a carbon tax, there can be a rebate of <clears throat> the carbon tax paid to the manufacturer. You can choose either or both. Um, some economies like the California system, they don't rebate any money if you export. You build it in California, they tax power coming in from other states, but they don't rebate that tax for power exported from California. I do want to flag just briefly one idea <clears throat> that Bill Nordhaus, who's the Sterling Professor of Economics at Yale University and the Nobel Laureate for his work on carbon pricing, has put out in the, in the common press. Um, there's a link in foreign affairs there for you. The challenge, of course, is, is there's kind of a, th these leakages make a incentive for countries not to put a carbon tax in. They can be the low cost provider selling dirty goods into economies that have adopted a carbon tax. And they look like a low cost provider and they gain a relative trade advantage. 
To address that, Bill has suggested something called, he calls a carbon club, where each nation as part of this club would be imposing an internal comprehensive carbon tax and a 5% carbon border tariff on all imports from nations outside of the club. So within the club, there's what amounts to free trade or at least untaxed trade for carbon purpose. But outsiders face a reasonably large tariff selling in. And he's done a lot of modeling with this and it looks from his modeling as though this would be, have two very desirable properties. First, it would be optimal. That is to say any self-interested nation would choose to be in rather than to be out and face that carbon tariff on all of their exports to members of the club. And second, it would be stable so that once you're in, you don't have an incentive to leave the club. And he thinks this might be a path for getting most of the world's economy to adopt a carbon tax collectively. The thorniest, and I, as an economist, I don't have a lot to say on this one, but it certainly is the central political debate, is what do we do with the revenue from a carbon tax? Um, estimates by the Tax Foundation suggest that a carbon tax could raise on the order of $2 trillion over 10 years. Um, obviously a lot of variables, but this is a lot of money we're talking about. There are, I'll say, three general categories of what we're doing with that money. First, we can simply use it as general revenue to reduce our deficit. Um, this is probably going to be very attractive given the huge deficits we are currently running because of the COVID-19 response. But realistically, a carbon pricing scheme won't go into effect anywhere uh, in the next year or so. A, an approach that's been floated by several organizations, most notably former secretaries of state, Howard Baker and George Schultz, is something called the tax and dividend program. And this is fairly straightforward. You put a carbon tax or, or permit structure up front, as discussed, and take all that money and divvy it up amongst US residents. Uh, this is a familiar structure, if any of you know the Alaska Permanent Fund. They have uh, taken all the royalty money from the Alaska North Slope oil that went through the pipeline, put that in a permanent fund, and everyone gets a check every year. There are real issues in thinking about how that money goes out, though, because it amounts to a wealth transfer from <clears throat> people who use a lot of carbon intensive product to those who don't. And that could sound like a great thing until you start asking who particularly are we taxing? You know, Maine is the most rural economy. It has some of the oldest housing stock. Um, rural people have higher carbon profiles and they drive more and they also tend to live in older houses that are using more heating oil. So we think think through those issues about understanding how this could be affected, affecting different people, what incentives there are, do we want to further incentivize depopulating the rural counties of the state and sending everyone to Portland, um, which is in effect what some of that incentive could do. Another completely different idea of what to do with money instead of handing it back to everyone as just a check is to use that increased revenue to speed the transition to a clean economy. Uh, for instance, AOC is Green New Deal. It would fall in this category. So th this would include things like enhancing R&D in carbon reducing technologies for industry and for power generation and, and transportation. Improved worker training to help those being displaced from high carbon intensive jobs to a new economy and to improve infrastructure resilience. Now, of course, these aren't exclusive. We could take some of the money and use it in a Green New Deal form. We could take some of the money and dividend it back. So, but this discussion is really a political dis discussion and highlights the need to have good policymakers in office 
to have that conversation. So let me wrap up by laying out a few ideas for what you can be doing as a voter to help support getting a carbon price to address the climate crisis we're facing. First, become even more informed. Uh, this is a huge topic and you can spend a lot of time with it. I would strongly recommend every voter here uh, to go to the Resources for the Future site. RFF is a great organization down in Washington, DC. They have free webinars that go out every week or two. The link I've put there for the carbon pricing is a great resource and includes in it a carbon calculator that you can go and play around with ideas of, you know, what if we did this? What if we did that? How, how does that affect the whole economy? So you go there or, and just, you know, a Google search on carbon pricing will reveal a wealth of people talking about this. Get out and talk to carbon pricing with your friends. I think this is a case where people don't understand what it is. And so it seems unfamiliar and scary. Of course, vote. That's the key thing we all can do. And, and try to use your votes to elect candidates who support carbon pricing. And tell them that the reason you're voting for them is that you they like carbon pricing. Once we get candidates in, we have to hold them accountable. And so I am looking personally at candidates who have proven skills in consensus building. There are hard problems that have to be solved here. We don't want to have a situation where a democratic majority shoves an answer down a minority's throat. Uh, we want to see broad consensus and finding the right solution. Finally, there are things we can be doing in even in Maine that inch towards carbon pricing, even if the leakage problems and import export problems may overwhelm the idea of doing a comprehensive carbon pricing. 54% um, of our state's carbon emissions are from the transportation sector, principally motor fuels. So if we were to increase the motor fuel tax, for instance, that looks a lot like a one sector carbon tax, but that sector covers more than half of our emissions. Uh, also a lot of that, at least in historical times, is paid by people visiting the state. And so is not a direct tax on Maine, at least in full, uh, on Maine residents. So with that, uh, let me turn the mic back over to Abby for a wrap up. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, that was a great overview of a really complicated topic. Um, Robert has provided a couple of resources where you can learn more, which I sent links through the chat. Carbon pricing and other pricing mechanisms are currently being discussed by the Energy Working Group of Maine's Climate Council. Let me share a slide with some information about that. Maine's Climate Council is currently drafting a new climate action plan for Maine this year. That plan will include recommendations to reduce Maine's greenhouse gas emissions by at least 45% by 2030 and at least 80% by 2050. It will also help create a clean energy economy for all Mainers and will help communities in the state prepare and adapt for the serious and costly consequences that will be wrought by the climate crisis. Maine Conservation Voters is serving on several of the working groups of the Maine Climate Council and along with our partners across the state, we're using those roles to make Mainers' voices heard in the process. Most of the Climate Council events are public and there's usually time for public comment at the end of them. The energy working group that Robert serves on is actually meeting today at 2 p.m. So if you are interested in getting involved, I'll send a link to the Climate Council website through the chat um, in a moment. Uh, in addition, if you'd like to learn more about the policies being considered by the Climate Council, Climate Maine, along with several, sorry, Maine Conservation Voters, along with several other um, organizations across the state, 
are hosting a joint webinar in a couple of weeks on Wednesday, May 27th from noon to 1.30 p.m. Um, stay tuned for an invite email to that next week. If you're not on MCD's email list and you'd like to be, you can sign up on our homepage, mainconservation.org. And I'll also send a link to register for that event through the chat in a minute as well. Um, start, feel free to start sending me your questions for, for Robert about carbon taxes through the chat. Um, and then one last um, note is that we will be sending you all a short survey um, after this event and would appreciate you taking a few minutes just to let us know what you thought. Um, and that will include some, some other links to resources we talked about today. So with that, shift over to Q&A. Let me open the chat. Um, oh, there it is. Sorry. Zoom was being slow. All right. We have gotten a few questions. Thank you all. This is a question from Patricia. Why is it problematic to have a negative tax paying people to sequester carbon? Don't we have negative income taxes for low income heads of households? So it's not so much uh, problematic to have it. It's more challenging, I think, just in terms of administrative issue, trying to collect the money and having the um, having the state providing tax treatment down down to people who are managing that. The challenge with a lot of the negative carbon technologies is measurement and verification. Uh, trees grow naturally. So if we're trying to, you know, a common thing that's happening here in Maine is use of enhanced forestry management to capture carbon. When you have private companies who are buying carbon credits, they will set in place a due diligence process to assure them that they are buying the real deal. Uh, we would have to do that at a government level if we were going to be providing them a negative tax uh, basis. Possible. I, I think it's just, it's a level of, of challenge of developing expertise in a government that we don't have currently. Great. Thank you, Robert. Um, we have a couple of questions that are related. Um, the first is, are there any options within the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative Reggie Agreement to extend into other carbon sectors, such as transportation? To which I quickly say, there's a separate initiative being um, proposed called the Transportation and Climate Initiative, TCI, which is a similar structure. And then we have a specific question on that from Dan, um, which is um, Maine is trying to decide whether or not to join TCI. Does it provide a mechanism through which Maine could sell carbon credits to Southern New England at favorable terms for equity reasons? Or would Maine just get through TCI the proceeds of carbon credits for fuels consumed in Maine? So let me try to unpack those. Um, I'll start that with- That was a lot, sorry. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Reggie first. So the Reggie currently is a tradable permits for carbon emissions among wholesale electric generators. Uh, principally natural gas, because we've actually squeezed almost all of the coal and oil out of the New England system, though it in, down in the Pennsylvania area, there's still a lot of coal that's paying a lot of Reggie fees. Um, that could be expanded to other sectors, but of course, as a multi-state agreement, it would require all of the states to agree, which could be challenging. I mean, you really need a consensus rather than a majority vote, which would be sufficient to pass a comprehensive tax in Congress. The mechanism is, is very clearly set up in terms of carbon from power plants. So we, you know, we'd have to, again, build capacity to extend that. But I think it is an extensible framework, and it at least is working with a coalition of the willing that would make it more plausible. With respect to the TCI, I think that's a, it's an interesting framework and one that I generally support. Uh, 
I think the challenge does come down to the equity issues. I'm not aware that a TCI has any ability to sell credits because it really is focused on transportation fuels rather than overall carbon emissions. Uh, that it's in some ways its own limitation, that it's not trying to be comprehensive, but focused on transportation fuels. Um, it would, however, flow you know, a lot of revenue into Maine's coffers, as I understand how the allocation of money would go from there. Maine would get a pro rata share. And you know, that gives us the political capability of deciding how we can address any inequities being created by that tax through uh, dividending or otherwise benefiting communities that would be potentially harmed by a transportation fuel. Thank you. Um, Jeff Jones from Citizens Climate Lobby asks, because emissions know no state boundaries, has the council considered supporting federal legislation like HR 763? Um, short answer is no. Um, the Climate Council is really focused on actual steps we can take to reduce our footprint. One of the questions that is in front of the council is though whether we should be changing and conforming how we count our carbon emissions to align with other states in New England. Uh, if you it's a curious property that some of the things we, we measure, for instance, the electric power sector, we, we look at the amount of power we generate inside the state of Maine and look at the carbon emissions from that. We are not looking at carbon emissions from other states for the power we use, nor are we subtracting from our equation the carbon, the renewable energy credits that are being bought by Southern New England. So getting the accounting right will at least give us a better clarity about what we're doing on our own bottom sheet. I think the idea of, of endorsing a particular piece of federal legislation is really beyond what we've been asked to do as technical experts and would go much more to the political uh, key policymakers like our state senators, our, our state's federal senators and our congressmen to push that forward. Totally agree, thank you. Um, Deanna asks, where do subsidies for fossil fuel companies fall? <laughs> yeah. How do we handle those? That's a great question. Um, you know, the obvious answer is we should be getting rid of them. Um, you subsidize things in, in economic theory, you subsidize things where there is a benefit being created that the producer doesn't capture in full. Um, you know, this is why things like roads are typically owned by the government and operated by the government because it's very hard to capture the value that's created by your road. Um, toll roads work, but that's, that's hard. I, the subsidy structures for oil and gas existed for over 100 years because early on they thought that we needed to encourage that technology. It was going to transform the economy in a very positive way. It certainly transformed the economy. Um, I don't know anyone who can make a serious argument that the oil and gas industry needs subsidies to stay alive or that we care about them staying alive if they need subsidies. So to my mind as an economist, we should just scrap all that. You know, you're gonna to have to do that in, in a phase out way so you don't disrupt the economy too, too badly, but um, needs to happen. And, and you know, it could be done in a sort of sideways way by simply putting a lot of taxes on that industry, absorbing back more than all of the subsidies we get. I agree. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm processing this. Time. Richard asks, what are the pros and cons of including, including agricultural production in carbon? Well, I mean, the, the pros simply is that 
it is a source of carbon. There are agricultural techniques that produce less carbon than other techniques. For instance, um, if you are doing plowing all your fields and turning over the land rather than using um, black on the space, but you, you can do a dry field planting where you don't have to do as much disturbing the land that leaves more carbon sequestered. You can be more responsible with how you use chemicals and using more composting to put more carbon back into your soil. So there's, there's, there's distinct things we can do in the agricultural sector that help. In fact, arguably that's what we have to do if we're going to move all the way to where we need to go. So by excluding it from a carbon regime, you're not providing that financial incentive to find low carbon ways of producing your crops. Um, and depending on how it's taxed, it also may not fully value, for instance, the embedded carbon in beef as opposed to the embedded carbon, much lower embedded carbon in vegetables. And so if we want to be steering again, consumer choices away from high carbon diet to a lower carbon diet, using prices is a way of doing that. Um, the challenge of, of going that direction though is just how do you do all of the monitoring, assessments, measurements that you would need to be accurate about that. Um, and government programs need to have a certain dependability and predictability and you know what the rules are, you play by the rules and you, you come out the other side that could be very challenging to put together. Now there is a, there's a group in the uh, Climate Council support groups, the um, farmlands and I think farmlands and forests are in the same group, um, working lands group that is, is looking at ways of improving that. This may be a case where instead of taxing and having, having the challenges of uh, measurement and that we simply go to a more regulatory structure and say, you, you should use best practices here, best practices there. Um, a quick plug, if folks are, are curious about agricultural methods to, to sequester more carbon, we actually did a lunch and learn on that a couple of weeks ago and you can find the video recording of that on our webpage. A related question, how much of our emissions are from fuels versus things like agriculture, deforestation, um, non burning fossil fuel sources? Yeah, I don't know. Um, that's, a, that's a very technical question and I have not seen the data on that. The, the numbers I quoted are strictly like 54% coming from the transportation sector. That is 54% of our fossil fuel related carbon. Um, other anthropogenic, sources such as uh, agriculture, marine uses, non-fossil non fuel marine, um, and forestry, I have not seen good numbers on. Um, I think Brian sent this question during the TCI conversation. He asks, how would carbon be measured? So I think what he's asking is, how would the, um, the fee portion of, of TCI work? Yeah, um, the, the carbon is actually pretty straightforward. When you burn a fuel, you can just, you know, that's a chemical process and you can calculate per gallon of gasoline how much carbon dioxide is produced by combustion. So that's a straight um, bit of science that you can work through um, for each of the different grades of, of petroleum product you might be taxing. Um, Darcy asks, the fee and dividend method that is proposed by some groups sounds really complicated. How feasible do you think it is in practice in a widespread? Well, I mean, Alaska has been doing it for decades. Uh, it's really not that hard. Uh, you, you collect money, it goes into a trust fund, and every quarter it writes checks. So it's, it's really no more complicated than uh, but I think we, we saw a little bit about this with the um, stimulus checks that many households got from the government recently. You know, that was just, again, a direct deposit into people's bank accounts. 
I mentioned an interesting, I hadn't heard this before. I, I'm working closely with Al Gross, uh, a classmate of mine from Amherst, who is running for the US Senate in Alaska. And he was mentioning that one side benefit of the uh, Alaska Permanent Fund distributions is that everyone who signs up to receive that money is automatically registered as a voter. So they have a 99% registration rate in Alaska, which is by far the highest in the country and provides an easy way of, of linking government payment to your ability to vote in, in the government processes. Um, we received another another comment reiterating that Maine is just one state. There's only so much we can do as a state to address the climate crisis. And I'll just um, echo Robert to say that the Maine Climate Council is tasked with just tackling what the state of Maine in and of ourselves can do. But there are organizations like MCD and others that we pressure our, our federal delegation, our senators and our congressional representatives to take action on a federal level to address climate change. So if, if you all are, are eager to take action in, in that um, realm. Uh, and, and I'd augment that, I agree. Yeah. Trying to figure out what we can do for ourselves. Um, two thoughts. First, it's very important to be building regional coalitions for things, but that requires leadership. Um, and as a state whose motto is Dirigo, I think we can be providing leadership for other New England states, or at least be willing to work with other New England states to find regional solutions that could be more effective than one state solutions. Secondly, I think it is always important to do what you can. I mean, none of us can ever do more than what we can do. So the fact that we are a small state uh, with already a relatively low carbon economy because of our huge investments in renewable energy over the years, um, we can still lead. I mean, if I'm in a lifeboat and I can't bail it out by myself, but I'm still gonna take my bucket and keep bailing the boat to see if we can keep it afloat. Uh, it's just important that we each do what we can. And collectively that sets a good example <clears throat> for everyone. And you know, at least you know you've done what you can do. And that's all we're asking anyone to try. And I'll just add that we've seen with other environmental initiatives that when one state takes really bold action and lays this framework of template legislation for how you do it, it makes it so much easier for other states to jump on board and then that creates this domino effect of once enough states have done something, it makes federal action much more possible. So one of the most exciting things to me about Maine's carbon, uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction goals is that they're so bold that you know once we've created this climate action plan, we're opening the door for for other states in our country as a whole to to do the same thing. We just got one more question. Um, re uh, regarding regional partnerships, is there any any plans between Maine and the Massachusetts Attorney General Maura Healy? I'm not sure exactly what. what yeah, I, I'd, I'd want a little more clarity from the questioner about where- I, I would just say for regional initiatives, Maine is already part of um, the regional greenhouse gas initiative that Robert talked about and, and is considering this, this transportation and climate initiative that's similar. Another important partnership that's a little less visible um, there is a, the New England Council of State Utility Commissioners called NESCO that talk a lot and they agree on a lot of major policy issues. You know, the New England power grid is, is operated by an organization called ISO New England, the independent system operator in New England. And they are not a policy making body, but their, in, their, their work impacts a lot of policy. So NESCO and Maine's role in NESCO is helpful in shaping the policy debate at, or the, the, shaping the rules and regulations that ISO New England puts forward to make sure they're better aligned with state policy. That discussion of how these federally operated markets, federal jurisdiction markets, 
work with state policy is a key question right now before uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and all of its pieces. Uh, it's critical that we get that piece right. But again, the electric generation sector is, is one segment, even on a national level, it's only about a third of the carbon emissions. Nationally, we're looking at about a third in the electric generation sector, a third in transportation, and a third in industrial, residential, and commercial uses. So we really need to think about policies that address all of those. A carbon policy is an underlayment for all of that, but probably is not a substitute, surely is not a substitute for individual regulation and, and tailored policy perspectives around each of the major sectors and even digging down within that. Um, I know that several organizations are very concerned about the idea that a carbon tax would preempt uh, state's ability to do other things. And that's something to look at closely when you look at federal bills. You know, is this saying we, we will pass a carbon tax, but you can't have a renewable portfolio standard underneath that, or you can't have some other desirable policy that your state wants because it's been precluded by federal action. So that is one of the key sticking points we have now that we, we need to be able to keep state action and state initiatives alive, even if we get a federal carbon tax. Every state's different. We all have different economies. All right, Robert, that is it. Any, any final comments before we wrap up? I, I thank everyone for your time and uh, stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you, everyone. And just, just a reminder that you'll get a, a follow-up email with a, a link to the recording and a, a quick survey. Oh, and I forgot to mention, uh, next Friday's Lunch and Learn, we're going to be joined by Brett Huguet, who is a professor of biology at Bates College. He's going to give us a crash course in tree identification. He's also going to talk about how native New England tree species um, can respond to stressors caused by climate change. So please join us. And, and we do these every Friday from noon to one. Um, so if you enjoyed it, come on back. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you, Robert. Bye, everyone.